and here we go Facebook live another ask Kevin good evening everybody lovely warm evening I'm sitting here in my Hawaiian shirt ish look at this cream soda it's a sad day when a man of my age is resorting to drinking cream soda it'll be whiskey afterwards it'll be whiskey afterwards good evening I hope you can all hear me and see me beautifully well good evening Matthew thank you for your wishes anybody else want to say good evening just to make you feel loved I want to feel the love tonight I want to feel that love I just want to reach out there to HSP land and feel that love coming over the airwaves <laughs> oh Forbes you're so predictable <laughs> Very sad. Yes, but look at the drinks I've got in the shelf when I go back indoors tonight. So, we are, here we go, another Ask Kevin. These are good. These are good. We've got some really interesting questions tonight. Very diverse. So, we're looking at Flash. We're looking at Black and White. And got some really weird questions from Tracy Clarkson. If we can fit them in. Tracy, you're not related to the Clarkson on the television, are you? The old grumpy fellow who doesn't dress very well. <laughs> I'm sure everybody asks. Good evening, Paul. Good evening, Sharon. Let's just see a few of these. So we've got Eileen. Hiya. Sharon. Hello there. Hiya, Paul. Good to see you. Right, let's get started, shall we? Let's get started. What's the first one? So... Uh, the first one, um, the first, I'll tell you what, the first one is going to be from Eileen, Eileen Welland. Now, Eileen, Eileen, let me just bring this up because I actually did produce, I did put this on a, on a PowerPoint. Let's see whether we can get this up on the screen. Um, that looks like it. That looks like it. Here it is. So I'm going to share the screen in a second and assuming this actually works, here we go and we should be able to see it any moment. Now, there we go. Oh, it's gone. There it is. So that's Eileen, nicked off her Facebook account. Um, you should know about Eileen. Eileen be everybody to the the race to be the very first member of the found founder members to the forthcoming academy she is in fact member number one you don't get many of those so congratulations Eileen both her and her friend Sharon came to me a couple of days before I was due to launch uh, desperate to become members and so uh, we or I allowed them in uh, a day ahead of everybody else and uh, before I put the advert actually I think you signed up on the day I sent the advert out so uh, it wasn't too too dreadful but Eileen is number one is number one Sharon is number two her best friend is number two so this is a question uh, just a quick question i've been challenged last week to post black and white photos i edited my previous raw or jpeg ones using layers in affinity affinity if you don't know is another piece of editing software a bit like um photoshop but i understand some people shoot in black and white uh and i think i'm right in saying the raw will still be in color so my question is what is the best way to shoot as normal standard color or shoot black and white and why okay okay so I can't demonstrate to you affinity um, even though I know it a little bit um, but some of the principles in affinity are identical to Lightroom and Photoshop so we may just have a, a look at them in a moment and I have Lightroom up on the screen behind me here Ooh, here Ooh, there there <laughs> there <laughs> Lightroom Lightroom so the question is, it's an interesting one. So for people who like to take black and white photos, what's the best way of doing it? Because with mirrorless cameras, for instance, you can normally switch over to black and white, take the picture in black and white, see it in black and white before you press the button. And when you press the button, you get a black and white picture out at the end. 
The problem is the black and white is only rendered black and white in JPEG. And if you're shooting RAW, it doesn't matter what you saw through the viewfinder or what you saw on the back screen. Excuse me, I've got people out. I've got the behind, this is a green screen behind me. Yeah, let me just show you what I've got behind me. Green screen. Green screen, yeah. Okay. Green screen behind me. And the other side of that is an open window into the garden. And outside, I can hear my wife pulling out the hose to water the, the plants at the end of the garden. I don't know whether you're picking it up. Are you picking this up? Because of the delay, I won't know for a few moments. We'll go back to the black and white. So here's the problem. You shoot, shooting JPEG, you can see the JPEG, <coughs> excuse me, a black and white image in the viewfinder, in the viewfinder or on the back screen, and I'm on a mirrorless camera. And when you look through it, it's black and white. Take the picture, it's black and white. It looks black and white on the back. Put it on the computer, it's black and white. But in RAW, looks black and white through the viewfinder, looks black and white on the back. Load it onto your computer, and it's not black and white. It's colour. It's a raw file. And it's normally a dull picture of its raw because it hasn't been hasn't been sexed up by the camera. It's just boring, dry, lifeless. It needs your work to make it look amazing. So the problem is that if you shoot in raw, the preview you get on your back screen is a JPEG preview. But when you load it on your computer, it will in fact be colour. So, <clears throat> if you want to shoot in black and white, you've got to shoot in JPEG. If you want, the best option is to set your camera to, to create two files when you take a picture. One JPEG, one RAW. So the JPEG stays in black and white, the RAW goes across in colour, and then you've got the opportunity of taking that RAW file, converting it to black and white, and doing amazing things with it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, um, if I'm going away on holiday, usually I shoot in JPEG, and I shoot a lot of JPEGs in black and white because I like black and white. On a Fuji camera, I'm sure I've mentioned this before, you can shoot with filters added in digitally, as if they've been as screwed on the front. So put, think of a black and white image back in the days of film. You put a red filter on, and the blue skies look really ominous, and you can do that digitally in the future. Don't know whether other manufacturers do it. It's quite possible. I've no experience of them. Um, but for everybody else who doesn't want to shoot JPEGs and wants to shoot RAW, I thought we'd look at some images. So um, let's look at, let's look at, let's look at this one. So here's a picture taken of me um, during a photo shoot a couple of years ago, um, nearby woods at the beginning of a year. So it's, uh, I think it was probably February time, something like that. And um, let's just go into the develop module and um, let's just see whether I've got the exposure. I'm just going to tweak the exposure down. It's a little bit overexposed. Bring down the highlights so we can see some details in her dress. Okay. Now, in Lightroom, and it's probably the same in Affinity, there's a single button to convert, convert this color image into a black and white one. On Lightroom, if you hit the key or the button V, it changes it to black and white just like that and if you press V again it goes back to color so you can toggle between black and white and color and because you can do it so easily if you want to work on just the reds or the pinks or the greens or the yellows you can toggle backwards and forwards and say now what color was that ah oh, yeah so let's adjust that color so look um, let's just go to black and white and we'll open up the black and white drop down menu over here in this um, panel black and white panel if we were shooting in color by the way it's not black and white anymore it's the HSA HSL that's hue saturation luminance color panel as soon as you go over to black and white it changes to a black and white panel but notice you've still got color sliders and these color sliders represent the original colors which are in this picture which are being hidden by this black and white V 
virtual black and white mask on top so for instance um, trees trees and foliage tend to be green and yellow so if I push up the yellow you see see what happens it the black and white part of the image which is representing the yellows gets brighter or darker and the same for green so I can make the greens look really cool um, she's probably got I think she had a little bit of pink in her top she did so if I adjust the reds going back to black and white and I darken it down I can make a pink a bit darker or I can brighten it up but what about the blues there are people here wearing blue tops and blue jeans and I can adjust those so you see if you shoot in raw you've got the option to go into the image and manipulate some of those colors in a way that the camera could never do let's find a different image so this is a good one this is uh, this is Brighton a couple of summers back and we'll convert this into black and white and it's okay it's okay but I think we can do better hitting D for develop to take us to the develop module and the first thing I want to do is to do something with those skies now I could just darken them down like that but I'm not sure whether you see aqua also affects the color as well here's an interesting thing you may not know about in Lightroom if you're looking at a color and you're not sure whether it's in this case is it aqua or is it blue click on this little target thing this little round thing here see how it changes shape when I move over it if you click on that and now look my my mouse cursor has changed if I would have to click on the screen and drag it up or down I can darken or brighten the picture and what it does it affects the colors it detects in the image so you can see it's moving blue a lot but it's also moving aqua a little bit so I'm just going to take it down make it look a little bit ominous maybe to there I'm going to tweak it again in a moment don't worry now these guys are sitting on pebbles which are going to be yellowy or orange so I'm going to do the same again I'm going to click on that thing and it's just oh, it hasn't picked it up let's try again and drag it up over this over the pebbles there we go it's just brightened up the pebbles a little bit that's good now um, I'm going to just take the blue down a bit more because I want to show you something and go back into the basic and I'm going to push the highlights I'm actually going to push the whites up and the highlights down because I want, don't want to overcook the, the, these whites here so we get some really stormy looking stuff going on here maybe just take it down a fraction and I think that the sky is probably too much so I'm going to go back to black and white bring it back up a little bit gosh we've got a really very dramatic looking let's put a bit of a vignette on that um, and make it slow transition maybe a bit more wow see now I really like that what if we just cook the blacks a little bit Ooh, uh, maybe that's too much you can see where I'm going with this that is quite a dramatic image let's make it full screen that's quite a dramatic image and actually what I started out with ah yeah what I started out with was that there we go it wouldn't let me do it in full screen so we went from there to there much of that particularly the sky was done by adjusting the blues and the color the aqua um, the orange brightened up the pebbles to give contrast against the dark figures all over it and the rest of it was done in the main basic panel there the basic panel now if you shot in JPEG you would not have that control so to answer Eileen's question what's the best way to shoot standard color or to shoot in black and white and the answer is like nearly all my answers it depends <laughs> it depends on how much control you want over the image so if I'd shot that just in JPEG I wouldn't be able to make those changes to it and I like I like that dramatic look but you know sometimes you don't always want that you just want 
what the camera gives you. So it depends. Um, I think as purely as a photographer wanting to explore my creative opportunities, I would shoot in raw. It will always give you much more fun playing around with it to see what you can bring out with it. But really, there's no rule. Both work, but for different purposes. I hope that's helpful. I hope that's helpful. Right, good. That's question number one. Now, before we go on to question number two, can I just see whether there's any questions related to black and white and whether we shoot in colour or whether we shoot in black and white? Anyone got any questions at all? I'm just having another swig of my... Um, let's go back to me. Another swig of my drink. And if I just click on there and hit that button there, boom, I come back. No other questions? Okay. So, um, I think we'll go on to question two. And my apologies to Paul Fenton, who I detected uh, earlier on. He's in the group. Um, and I, I've emailed him because I, he'd sent this in for a previous week and I completely missed it. I don't know where it went. Anyway, I emailed him and said, look, I found your question. I'll do it tonight. So I'm going to do it tonight. And, um, oh, well, there's a message from Eileen. So let's just, let's just see what Eileen said. Thank you. I do both, but we'll do for raw, for black and white. Good. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Going back to Paul. So Paul is actually a really good photographer. Um, he's a wedding photographer locally in Fleet. And if I had a browser up and running, I'd just show you his website. Don't think I've got one running. No, it doesn't matter. Um, so, Paul, I checked you out, and um, I would have no problems with recommending you as a wedding photographer. The images are excellent, mate. Really, really nice. Really nice. It's just a pity, of course, that most, if not all, wedding photographers are doing very little at the moment because of the, uh, the lockdown. So I'm guessing, like me, you've had to... Um, put your weddings on hold I, I, I actually had one come through today it's meant to be do, uh, an August wedding and it's now been moved to July so I've had two of my weddings already moved to July next year and another one to I think it's May so it's, it's all happening but I don't shoot a lot of weddings I just do a few to keep my finger in but um, it's I'm not like you yeah I used to be like you but now I, I spend most of my time doing this so anyway just thought I'd let you know that I thought your pictures are Pretty damn good, uh, if not very good indeed. So well done. Now, um, Paul sent me this picture. He says, Hi Kevin, if I'm honest, my biggest hurdle is flash. I manage with it, but I feel it's not as fast and intuitive to get the result I'm looking for as fast as I like. Uh, scenario is, if you come into a space at an event which is poorly lit, Conditions are gloomy with dark wood panels and poor but warm CCT lighting. So this is lighting where you can change the colour of it, I believe. Bounce flash is favourable. Uh, oh, bounce flash in favourable settings is generally not a problem, but it is not so favourable a lot of the time. What is your usual process that you go through in your mind to get where you need to be in terms of settings? <sighs> Meaty. I realise this is pretty intuitive for some, but I find that I don't do enough of it to have created that automatic approach. What are your thought processes? Big question. Big question. Oh, Paul sent me a message. He says, weddings... He said, oh, come on. Your, wed your wedding's excellent. He's blushing. Now, he's particularly blushing now because I put his message up on the screen. Listen, we're all in this we're all in this business together. We should big each other up. And um, I don't mind bigging up someone whose pictures are good. This is good as that. Okay, let's go back to your question. So, so I've actually had this situation. I can think of a number of weddings where I've I've shot the wedding and it may, it may have been it may have been in the church, may have been elsewhere in a large 
um, venue and then everyone breaks for the reception particularly as the latter part of the day where the light started to fade and you've got dark wood panels and gosh it can be a real pain so if it's still light outside and you can shoot with natural light I find the dark wood panels attractive as shots because I'll underexpose the exposure compensation I'll drop it down a couple of stops maybe to make the pictures very dark and moody I, and I remember one particular wedding anniversary it's a 40th I think it's a 40th wedding anniversary it's quite a significant one actually it might have been more than that because the couple were in their 80s so it might be, it was a 60th anniversary wedding anniversary it was a it was a serious one and um there was this friend of the family who uh, very dark skin shaven head uh, probably in his 60s and he was sitting in his black not black very dark um dark leather wing back chair you know those ones with those brass studs around against this um uh, oak panelled wall very very dark he was very dark dark suit and he was quite near a small open window and I got a small amount of light just coming in and catching the side of his face and, and glistening it now you couldn't do that easily with flash not without a lot of setting up and practice but just to catch it in natural light was lovely but your problem is what do you do when you've got a venue where it's dark um, and you want to use flash so do you use flat bounce flash or don't you? So those of you who don't use flash or only just started looking at it, bounce flash is where you don't direct the flash directly at someone, but you bounce it off a wall or bounce it off a ceiling uh, or bounce it off one of those reflective umbrellas. But by bouncing it, you're enlarging the area of light that hits the individual. When it's a single point of light on top of your camera, fired at someone that tiny little point of light is very unflattering because it 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 creates very harsh shadows like being at a midday sun and and the shadows aren't good and, and i mean it may be some rugged face macho kind of figure like me could get away with it but you know kids and ladies it's very unattractive so you bounce most of the time you bounce flasher by bouncing it hits the wall then it gets bigger and it wraps over a larger area and you just get more and more light thrown around and it's it's a more attractive light and of course the question i don't know the answer to paul and perhaps you can answer this while i'm rattling on is how do you work with flash in a wedding do you just stick it on your camera or do you have remotes around the room do you have it on stands elsewhere so it's a, is it a single flash or is it a single flash on the camera which you just bounce or or do you actually ever just point it? i can't believe looking at your pictures you point flash at anybody your pictures are too nice for that so um, i'll have another swig of my drink while you answer that So I'm hoping Paul's going to answer this. Do you have the uh, flash on your camera or do you have your stands? And unfortunately in, in um, Facebook Live, I can't actually invite you in to uh, take part in and chat to me. Although I might have the tape. There we go. There we go. So he's answered. Here we go. So let me just let's all look at this together usually on camera but sometimes two on the dance floor always avoid direct flash if possible good good let's look at a couple of things let's let's look at a couple of things i'm going to go back over to um lightroom uh, we want that one so uh, there we go good so let's go back and okay so i'm just going to put this up paul says bounce usually but the issue can be color cast from bouncing yeah yeah i understand that i understand that okay so i'm going to answer this question not just to satisfy you paul but to fill in some gaps in knowledge for people who actually don't use flash in this way yet so typically um so one of my most famous pictures 
is this one and let's go full screen let's go full screen I said there we go good 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 and this was taken uh, with a total of four flashes four speed lights speed lights are the flashes that you bolt on top of your camera and um, I'm kneeling on the floor and I think I might have a picture of me kneeling on the floor oh, wrong way let's go the other way come on no nope. I'm trying to well okay maybe the next one then so I'm kneeling on the floor I've got these two C stands they call C stands because uh, back in the days of Hollywood this was the type of stands they had lighting on and they were a hundred inches high hundred is a century so they were called C stands I'm kneeling on the floor and above my head is this white translucent panel in an aluminium frame two meters by one and I've got two speed lights firing through that to illuminate the subject on the sofa now this is shot about 11 o'clock in the morning and we had the curtains pulled in the background but as you saw in the previous shot it's actually you know we've got the curtains open in the other side of the house leading out to the back garden and um, what we did was we put one light inside that lampshade it's been sellotaped to the inside of that lampshade it's got an orange gel on it and go back the other way one more another one outside in the hallway in a soft box which is a reflective box with a white panel on the front to diffuse the light but I got the white panel removed so the flash is just pointing into a foil reflector and shooting back out into this room through the doorway it's also got an orange gel on it and the idea is given the effect of tungsten light soft orange tungsten light um, but in the this panel here which has got two flashes firing through there's no gels over those because of what I wanted to do I'm going the right way I'm going the right way oh gosh I'm going the wrong way sorry about this guys it would be easy if I came in and out wouldn't it but I am um, there we go so the guys on the sofa are illuminated with white light these are supposed to be watching 3d telly this ages the picture when 3d TVs were the rage and um, so they're, they're illuminated by a white light and then in the background we've got the orange gels replicating um, tungsten. There's a little, little bit you can see it, there's a yellow beam of light coming upwards on that lamp, shooting up, that's the, that's the flash. The yellow beam of light shooting down, that's Photoshop, because I couldn't have a flash shooting in both directions at the same time. So when I looked at this, uh, the, the remit here was, um, I knew the lady with the T's, um, and um, she was in a camera club I was in and she wanted a family photo which wasn't a traditional traditional family photo she wanted something which personified them as a family and this is what they come up with the kids watching the telly dad reading the paper she brings the, the copies in and that's how we got there and when when I arrived oops hit the zoom button when I arrived and we looked around um, you're now asking me to think about my thought process. How did I figure this out? Well, I knew I had to, first of all, make sure that the people on the sofa were going to be properly illuminated. And I wanted it to be a soft light. And if I had bounced it off the ceiling, I would have lost quite a bit of control of that light because it would have been spreading all over the place. So by shooting it through that diffusion screen, it meant I could point the flashes at these people and it's a fairly even light between all four of them. Uh, the alternative would have been to use two soft boxes, but I just felt the screen coming from the same direction for all of them would produce a more even light. And then the other two, they they just came about while we were thinking, well, this is meant to be in the evening, night time. Let's, let's, let's add a little bit of ambient light. So they're really, they're just providing lighting for effect. They're not actually illuminating anyone. Although mum is being caught in the glare of the light coming in from the hallway and that is kind of nice I hadn't planned that that was just a bonus so in this shot really I was primarily concerned about making sure the people in the foreground were illuminated the rest of it was just window dressing 
Let's go and look at a wedding. Um, this is a couple, a couple of Novembers back, I think. It might have been a couple of Decembers back. And is at the Aviator Hotel in Farnborough. And um, I photographed the ceremony and they were moving upstairs. I think it's called the Skyline Bar or the Skyview Bar, something like that. And all down one side, they've got these lovely windows overlooking the runways of the airport. Fabulous. And the sun was just sinking low down, shining in through those windows. It was spectacular. Trouble is, as all the guests came up and sat down, they didn't want the sun in their eyes, so they pulled all the blinds down. And the blinds had a funny colour in them. And when you, when the sun filtered through that funny colour, they looked yellow. And the light inside the room was throwing some green onto it. It just looked horrible. So in the end, I stopped shooting with natural light and I went over to flash and it all got better. And at that point, I was shooting with a DSLR, full frame DSLR, um, a single speed light mounted on top of the camera, bounced off the ceiling, and I was using either an 85mm f1.2 or a 135mm f2. So both telephoto lenses, both flattering lenses, both capable of shooting people candidly from a distance and blurring out the background. Really good lenses. And I got a quite a lot of images like that and um, and I kind of proved to myself that this looking at them afterwards you know all this this talk of which I'd been guilty of years earlier saying you can't get candid pictures with flash you most definitely can um, but we're now approaching the cake cutting and the dancing and I needed more than just a single flash and my thoughts here Paul were that um, Actually, a couple of, couple of lights up on stands firing directly at, so they're actually pointing down, they're not bouncing off the ceiling, directly down at the people on the dance floor creates a really nice rim. So um, I didn't use the transmitter that I normally use for controlling my flashes. I left that in the bag and I put another flash on my camera. So I controlled... The two remote flashes, I've got one up in each corner on either side of the DJ. You can't see them in this shot, but you you will do shortly. So top left of this image out of sight, top right of this image out of sight. On two very high stands, I've got flashes pointing down towards the dance floor. And this cake is on the dance floor. Then the flash that's on my camera, I also bounced off the ceiling went up and it came down and gave some filling light because I've got light hitting this cake from both sides at the rear and then the light that's on the flash uh, on the camera sorry on the camera the flash that's on the camera is providing filling the two lights up in the air are, are, are actually in manual and the one that's on the camera is in TTL now if you don't know the difference between TTL and manual I'll give you a very quick description Manual is you control everything, you set the power of the light, and it stays at that. In TTL, it's, it's a kind of automatic flash. It senses how far away your subject is and adjusts its power to correctly expose them, whether they're 2 feet away or 20 feet away or 100 feet away. They either increase the power for the distant stuff or they reduce the power for someone who's close. So on the camera, because people are moving away from me and coming towards me the whole time and I'm moving towards them. Distance between me and the subject is changing constantly. That's in ETTL or TTL depending on the maker camera. Um, it's through the lens. The lens, uh, the exposure coming through the lens is communicating with the flash to give you the correct exposure. But the two lights which are up in the air, one in that corner <laughs> and one in uh, that corner over there, yeah, um, they're on manual because I didn't want their power. I didn't want them to be so bright they would try and brighten the room up too much because they, if I'd left them in TTL, their job would be to try and make sure the whole image was pre properly exposed, which would mean they'd flood in loads of light to try and make the picture really, really bright, whereas I wanted the light on my camera to do that. So for this shot, two lights, one up in that corner, one up in that corner, 
very high up, pointing down to illuminate the, a rim light around that cake. Then when people came into the scene, you've got lighting which is giving a three-dimensional aspect. If you've got a single light on, or if you're shooting from, from the front, even with it bouncing off the ceiling, you do lose some of that 3D effect, some of the dimension. So having three flashes going off here, and I think in this one as well, uh, I think the one on my camera was going off at this point. I actually can't remember. But what I was trying to do here, and I did this in a number of shots, is get some lens flare in. Because lens flare is very attractive. I find it very attractive. Very attractive. So I'm picking my... I'll take a test shot and I'll see just how much it's hitting the lens and coming through. And i move around and try another one. And eventually I found the angle. And I really like that. And here again, this was the bride and groom, and you've got, you can actually see behind her, I don't know if I move my mouse over this, whether you'll see it on your end. Um, I'm looking on my screen, oh, I can't tell from my screen, because my screen's got a 20 second lag. Uh, but just up here is one of the lighting stands, and the flash is right at the top up here. And it's giving her a lovely rim light around there, and then there is another light up in this direction. Oops, I've changed the screen. And this one, much the same thing. So you've got the lights from behind. And uh, I think at this stage I probably had turned off the one on the camera. Let's go back to the original question, though. What do I do? What do I... Oh, Matthew, I couldn't agree with you more. Here we go, here we go. Love a bit of lens flare. Love a bit of lens flare. Yeah, I do. Whether you're outdoors in the sun or where it's coming from a flash, there's something quite evocative about it. It's quite cinematic, isn't it? I rather like it. So the question, to answer Paul's question was, and his question was, uh, what's my normal thought process you go through in your mind when you go to a place in terms of settings? It really does depend on what you're trying to photograph. Because if you're photographing a place like a wedding where you know there's a dance floor you can concentrate the lighting towards the dance floor and actually that's quite easy if you're trying to light a room or a venue for a single individual or maybe it's the um the reception and people sitting around talking then that's less that's a tougher call because it really just depends on how big it is and i think to be honest with you for most of that stuff i'm going to get candy stuff with a bounce single cap single flash on top of the camera bounce off the ceiling now how do you deal with color casts good question quick swig so if you're photographing someone and you're bouncing your light off a nice white ceiling perfect and you can bounce off a nice white wall perfect but what happens if the wall's green Ugh. or red? Those colours get reflected back onto the individual. So, <laughs> okay, well, you can try and put the opposite colour on the flash, uh, a gel. So, for instance, if it's very, if, if, if you're getting a very kind of reddy orange uh, bounce back, then maybe put a blue filter um, on the flash. Or if you're getting a very sort of bluey greeny, I can't remember the opposite of green is, I don't use it very often. Um, but if you go on a colour wheel, whatever the opposite of green is, put that on as, as a gel. Buy a set of gels, put them on the flash, that'll counteract it. Or, and I've done this before, <laughs> I remember photographing some, actually, and the reason why I did it was because I wanted to do a bounce flash, but I, I didn't, ha actually, this was at the same, it was the same, it was the same venue, but a different event. It was a 40th birthday party. And just outside that room, there's a stairway. And I had a couple who wanted to be photographed. And the walls just weren't the right colour. So I got one of the guests to take his jacket off and turn with his back towards me wearing a white shirt. And I pointed my flash at his shirt and bounced the light off of his shirt onto the couple who were posing for the shot. That's one way of doing it. You could take an assistant with you with a reflector, open it up and, and, and bounce into that. Um, 
The other option, and you might say this is the coward's way out, is actually if you've taken shots like this and you've got really horrible colour mixes in, then you've really you can either work on those colours individually or just convert it to black and white. And black and white hides a multitude of sins. In those awful situations where the poor bride or the groom or the bridesmaid are hit from colours in lots of different directions, sometimes the only way out is to go black and white. If you've got enough power in the flash and you can bounce it off an area which is fairly neutral in colour, if that person up until that point is surrounded and being hit by, I don't know, blue light from outdoors, green light from fluorescence, orange light from a tungsten, they've got, all the, got three colours on them. If you can overpower those lights with your flash, you're, you're, so basically you take a shot as if you're underexposing so they're too dark and then light them mainly with flash, that will correct it. And that's an easy one. So I just, I'm going to say that again for those people who didn't follow. If you're photographing someone indoors and they are being illuminated by lights of different colour temperatures, blue, green, orange, and it looks horrible, take a shot, first of all, without the flash turned on, underexpose the shot quite a bit so you can barely see them. And then turn your flash on and let your flash be the main source of light. So when you take the picture, you won't see the effect of those other colours. The only light you'll see hitting them is what's being provided by the flash. And if you're hitting someone from the side with a bounce flash and it's coming back to them, you might maybe want to get a reflector on the other side to hit some of it back onto the other side of the face so it's not too dark. I hope that's that's helpful, Paul. I hope that's helpful. I hope we don't have time. Oh, good. Any questions? Any questions? Quick thinking. Yeah. What, the one with the shirt? Yeah, that was good fun. <laughs> um, any more questions? I'm going to have a look at one of Tracy's. I'm not sure we can do both of them. I think. Good. Lovely. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, TTL for bounce. So here's the question. Can we bounce on TTL? Absolutely, you can bounce on TTL. Um, I did um, that, that process of having two lights behind the subject, which are in manual and they don't change. And having a, um, so what I was in a, it was a big, there's a big restaurant in Fleet, which is now closed called We. And um, they had, they had a, we, there was a charity event, a cancer charity event. And I had some Bollywood dancers. And so the dancers were coming towards me like this rows of them dancing towards me and behind them right at eye level I had a single flash pointed towards me in manual to give rim light but to illuminate them I had another flash maybe about six feet behind me up high on a stand bouncing off the ceiling in TTL because TTL or ETTL whatever you want to call it it's it's strength is that it adjusts its power to suit the subject so as the sub as the dancers came closer to me it fired with less power as they went away it fired with more power to illuminate so whatever distance they were it uh, it would fire out the appropriate amount of power so ettl or ttl for bounce most definitely how are we doing one question from tracy then one trade one question um let's do this one she said i can't get my head around this one how to photograph a tree silhouetted against the moon with both the moon and the silhouette in focus tracy now did we do this for you or did we do this with another group i was talking on um, a recent webinar, and I can't remember whether it was an Ask Kevin or whether it was one of the webinars I run for my uh, my students about hyperfocal distance. And there is a way of calculating the hyperfocal distance based on your camera, your lens, your, your focal length, distance you are away from the subject, so that you get 
the thing you want in focus as well as infinity. Hyperfocal hyperfocal distance is the point at which you focus where you've got everything in a shot in focus. So um, if you set your lens to the hyperfocal distance, you will get both the tree and the moon, which is effectively um, in the point of infinity. Um, let's get rid of that picture. Let me come back to me. Hang on. That's better. I'll address you. So by photographing at your hyperfocal distance for the camera you're using, the focal length you've got, the distance you are from the subject, put those into one of the apps we talked about. And you did a masterclass with me, so you know about the apps. You find the point that you can focus at, which gives the subject you want plus infinity in focus. You'll get the tree in focus in silhouette, plus you'll get the moon. The, the thing is, I can see a potential problem here because I guess you want what you want is a really big moon. You want a nice big moon coming through the trees. And to do that, you'll need a long focal length. And that's where this theory is going to come unstuck because a long focal length has a very narrow depth of field. And I betcha the depth of field, even at shooting at something like F16, would not be wide enough to get the tree and the moon both sharp unless that tree is some distance away if the tree is you'd have to look at your depth of field tables if that tree was a long way away from you it's feasible it might work i've never tried it so i don't know i suspect in some of the shots you may have seen on facebook or elsewhere are actually two images combined together in photoshop but you know, it could it could work if you've got a tree on top of a hill a long way away, silhouetted against the moon. It could it could work if it's a long way away. It's all about the focal length, your camera, and how far away you are from that tree. There's an app for that. Hyperfocal distance we cannot cover in one minute. And I've covered it just recently in some detail, and I think it was on Ask Kev, but I'm not absolutely certain. Tracy, if you're not still not sure, give me a shout tomorrow, and um, we can we can talk through it again. But otherwise, it's uh, I might even be able to steer you towards the uh, the recording of the explanation where we looked at hyperfocal distance in uh, in detail. I'm pretty sure it was on Ask Kevin. Pretty sure it was. Okay, guys. Well, I think I am bringing this to an end now. Thank you so much. We'll do it again next week. We'll keep them going until the new academy is up and running. Uh, Matt, I think, who's my web genius, my web ninja, is somewhere listening here tonight. And um, he was going to send me something, and I haven't checked to see whether he did. Matt, as you're listening, did you, um, did you actually send me that stuff you were going to send me? Um... If you did, then I'll bring it up on the screen now. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Oh, there is a message for me. No. Okay. So I can tell you that what uh, what Matt's doing at the moment is massively transforming what's going to be um, the HSP Academy. Uh, we have beta testers on it, 20 of them and they come up with some extraordinarily good ideas and observations and we are completely redesigning it i have seen the draft it looks amazing and i will have it ready to show you at least the draft uh, the next ask kevin because it's uh, it's going to be quite incredible thank you everybody again and um, until next week i hope you can get out with your cameras and happy snapping cheers <laughs>